You gotta tell me if you can hear stuff. Uh, okay, so I don't know, like this. I'm, I can put you behind them, maybe. Can you see like this? <laughs> stop, mad stop. <laughs> What's up, code, by the way? Um, okay, you guys are gonna be able to see and hear. Okay, let me just talk to him real quick. за да мога да... да. Готова съм, абсолютно. А, да, готова съм. Само трябва да го... Я, гайз, ги ме сега. Okay, you guys won't be able to see me because I'm putting you to look at the guy who is speaking. So, yes. Um, do you guys want to see the PowerPoint? I guess. Tell boss he looks good. <laughs> I'll tell him. Okay, so like this, it should be okay. You should be able to hear him. I asked him to speak a bit louder. Okay, cool. Okay. <laughs> 
and move another one. Uh, so uh, we were very young, not that I'm old now, but we were even younger uh, in 2015 when with a bunch of friends and colleagues, journalists and so on, started ClinClean. It's an NGO for uh, CEO enterprises uh, where we do uh, different European and not only projects, focus mainly on journalism and humanitarian issues. And then we created the first back then um, website for investigations, for um, analysis, for coverage of, of different un, uh, under-reported uh, topics uh, in Bulgaria, uh, entirely crowdfunded at the time. That didn't last very long uh, because uh, this crowdfunding culture in Bulgaria we, still doesn't exist that much. Uh, and then for that time, uh, and my articles from there, uh, have been republished over 700 times uh, in over 30 media that's in Bulgaria and abroad. Uh, I also started uh, The Blade, the first online journalism show in Bulgaria, which uh, lasted for six months actually, before uh, our money ran out. Uh, we were trying to find uh, support from advertisers and other places, but they flat out uh, told us that we should not talk against the government, that was the boy police of government back then, and several other such issues uh, made us quit. But then we came back with uh, the first awards in Bulgaria for uh, bad journalism uh, or anti journalism awards as Golden Shishi. Uh, if you know, uh, Shishi is the name of the Ampeski, a person who has been sanctioned by the Magnitsky Act uh, in the United States and uh, considered the biggest media mogul in Bulgaria. This year, we are about actually next week to announce the second awards. Uh, members of our jury are Nikolai Steinko from the Anti Corruption Fund. We have colleagues from the Bulgarian National Radio and so on. So, came back with a vengeance. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, so why uh, we are here uh, and why uh, there are uh, less and less, or fewer and fewer actually, journalists covering war zones. Uh, first of all, let's, let's establish this as a ground base. Actually, this guy is a very cool guy. Uh, I met him in Qom uh, last year. That's the Islamic heart of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And as I was snapping photos of uh, different ayatollahs there, this guy just stopped in front of me, said like this, and, and said, you are a clown above my head. And then asked me to take a photo of him and make him famous around the world. So. I am making him famous around the world, hopefully. But why uh, journalists are not covering conflict zones that much anymore? I'll try to be brief. I know that there is a lot to be said about these topics, but still we are pressured by time and space. Uh, first of all, of course, it's expensive. So these trips to uh, Iran and Ukraine, um, I mean, the, the cost varies, but let's say that you can, if you're on a tight budget and if you don't want to stay in lavish hotels and so on. Uh, you can make a 10 to 10 to 14 days trip for about, uh, let's say, five to six thousand less, which is, let's say, two and a half to three thousand euros. Uh, it is possible to be done, but uh, if you're familiar with the Bulgarian media environment, and not only in Bulgaria, in most parts of the world, uh, the salaries are very low. The average salary of a Bulgarian journalist is somewhere around, in Sofia especially, um, outside of Sofia is even lower, well, 1,500 to 2,000 less. So that's 750 euros to 1,000 euros. And you can imagine only for one trip, producing several articles with not that big of influence and impressions uh, that this, um, uh, this, uh, these money are not uh, a desirable uh, you know, idea to be spent on covering conflict zones. And the second reason is, as I said, they don't generate that much impressions because an article about the new boyfriend of a football star or a singer will generate many more uh, impressions, sadly, not only in Bulgaria but abroad as well. Then the third is, it's dangerous and difficult to arrange, it takes a lot of time to arrange such visits, and it's dangerous for the journalist himself or herself. And it's a very bad publicity if your um, employee gets killed there. Uh, and the last reason which uh, we've seen a lot uh, lately is, uh, well, I'll, I'll quote this 
song, uh, text, video, I, I won't sing it, I cannot sing very well. Video killed the radio star. Uh, so the rise of citizen journalism, now everybody has a phone, everybody can, can report from these places. And as you can see with Ukraine or with Iran or other places, uh, they can just say what is happening, they can send photos and videos with good quality, but this is not what journalism is all about. But these are the main reasons why uh, big media and especially smaller ones don't send their people to conflict zones. Still we have, of course, Reuters, we have um, uh, France Press, we have uh, independent and big uh, international uh, media outlets, but still, uh, again, it's easier for a Bulgarian or Estonian or even uh, German or a Mexican uh, website or newspaper to just translate an article that's been written by somebody else. And even, you know, steal it right away. Can we please have the next slide? Okay, so uh, what is important to know uh, in covering conflict zones? So first of all, everybody uh, is at fault, at least in some way. Uh, you cannot go there. What, what we see a lot with Ukraine now, and I'll give some examples actually in, in a minute. What we see a lot with, let's say, Ukraine, everybody speaks one side of, of the spectrum speaks about the bad things that Russia is doing, the other side speaks about the bad things that Ukraine is doing. Uh, there is a lot of propaganda going on on both sides, although admittedly the Russian one is horrible. Uh, but you have to, you know, hide your own feelings and uh, predisposition to a certain topic and side in the conflict. Then uh, people's lives are more important than the story. You may want to report on that. So I'll, I'll give this example. When there is a car accident somewhere and uh, the journalist goes to the victim or to the relatives of the victim and asks, how are you feeling? You know, well, their, their son just died in a car crash. How can they be feeling? Uh, but a lot of journalists abroad, they don't consider the trauma that the locals have gone through when they're reporting or they do not consider their safety, actually, because uh, in places like Iran, where uh, I went undercover, uh, a lot of people who were talking to me, they were actually in bigger danger, danger than I was. Uh, then find someone you can trust to inform people where you're going. So again, with the case of Iran, um, and other places where the government is hostile towards you, or China, or Saudi Arabia, or, or Egypt, uh, you have to know who you're talking to. You have to know who you can trust. In Iran, that was pretty easy. Women without hijab, you can trust them, you know. Uh, women with hijab, not, you know, so, so, men with, uh, especially, so, they have this uh, religious, uh, it's a sign of, of religious feelings and, and thinking, to have these big rings uh, in Islamic countries, and especially in Iran. So if you see a guy with big, kind of, you know, kitsch rings, and especially the, the beads, I think it was called, uh, you can be certain that this person is very religious and most likely he uh, won't be against uh, you know taking off uh, the hijab he won't be against wearing the hijab actually so it's probably not a good idea to talk to him so always try to learn uh, where you're going and then keep in mind the repercussions on your on your life in 2017 when i was at the same type of uh, uh, event uh, but where you were, and I was speaking to a Scottish journalist who was specializing in uh, conflict zones. I don't remember his name. He was a very cool guy. Uh, we asked him, what is it like covering um, conflict zones? And he said, well, first of all, I spent at least one night in every prison in the Middle East. Also in Glasgow. He was from Scotland, obviously, and he was making a, a joke. And then he said more seriously, he said, well, uh, so my wife, cannot stand me, uh, my family cannot stand me, I have to drink a lot to get away from what I saw and what I felt, and uh, in the end my, life, my wife left me five years ago, she was like 40 years old, something like that. Um, and basically what he and other uh, colleagues uh, in big Western media actually who cover war zones, they either quit at some point uh, because they cannot maintain a stable social life, or they, they get down the rabbit hole uh, with abuse of substances or bad personal life or uh, some of them get killed so you have to know that it's a big adrenaline rush it's very interesting but it has big repercussions on your life if you chose 
specialize in this area of journalism, which in Bulgaria, admittedly, is you know almost impossible because um, the, big, the the media doesn't send anybody anywhere except to the border to have a few shots. Maybe may have the next slide. Okay, so specifics of Ukraine. Uh, that's Hotel Ukraine in Chernihiv, uh, which was destroyed several days before I arrived there. It was during the Russian occupation. So I went to Ukraine June last year. Um, so the specifics of Ukraine, what, what you should be aware in, in a place like this. So Ukraine is, besides the Russian army, is very safe place for uh, foreign journalists. Uh, there is no danger talking to anybody saying I'm from this media, I'm from this country, can you tell me what's happening and so on. But the danger there, uh, the specifics that you have to be aware of are that especially we as, as presidents of a Western country and I suppose that we all support Ukraine in the war effort against Russia, should be aware of, of not you know, glorifying the Ukrainian government and Zelensky and other people there. There are Nazi groups in the army. There are a lot of critics of Zelensky. Uh, before the start of the war in December, uh, so not 2022, in December 2023, there was a poll in Ukraine which put his popularity somewhere around 20 something percent. People really hated Zelensky uh, because he was at that time a guy of the oligarchs, of Kolomoisky, of Andreev, of, of a lot of. Uh, oligarchs there, and Ukraine was basically not doing so well, it is not doing better now, but still, and after the war started, naturally, his popularity skyrocketed because people had to defend him. Uh, very few people I spoke, I met in Ukraine and spoke with them, I'm talking about soldiers, politicians, regular people, they said, we like Zelensky 100%, they said, we support him now, we will support him until the end, until we beat Russia. After we win the war, Zelensky has to go because he is very corrupt. He wanted to sell our defense missile systems and weapons before the start of the war. And actually, um, Poroshenko's party stopped him. At the same time, these people say Poroshenko is no better. But still, we have to be, try to be objective uh, in what is happening in Ukraine. I know it is very hard and I know that any kind of criticism against their government that is being expressed right now may be met with severe hostility or someone can blame you that you are pro-Russian or something like that. Not at all, I'm very much against Russia, but as a journalist, we have to be objective and we shouldn't uh, you know, try to sugarcoat the things that are happening. Another thing is that Ukraine, before the start of the war, was the biggest black market of weapons in Europe and one of the biggest in, in the world because of the supply of weapons for the Donbass war that has been raging since 2014. May I have, please, the next slide? So, this guy here is Andy Paloma. He used to be, he, he left Ukraine actually a couple of months ago, uh, and we, st we are still in contact with him. He is, uh, used to be a Swedish volunteer in the Ukrainian army. So, uh, he, so I, I met several, several Ukrainian soldiers that are, were willing to speak to me. Uh, and uh, a lot of foreign uh, fighters there that because they're, they're way more open than, than the Ukrainians actually that said a lot of things like yes we will fight for Ukraine until the end yes Russia has to be defeated but there are these it is very hard to say how big but as I said there are these Nazi groups in the Ukrainian army they say we, we cannot pinpoint the exact percentage but let's say 5% that do the same things to the Russian uh, army or to the uh, Russian ethnic um, Ukrainians, uh, ethnic Russian Ukrainians, same things that the Russian army is doing to the Ukrainians. We're talking about rape, torture, uh, murder and all those things. We are talking about selling of weapons, so a lot of the foreign uh, fighters they are saying we cannot afford weapons. They do not supply us with food, they do not supply us with weapons, but at the same time our lieutenant is driving a new Porsche. How is this possible? Uh, and uh, I especially put Andy here because he's a very interesting kind, kind of a guy because in the Western media there is this type of glorifying the volunteers who went to Ukraine and hands down, I, I respect them very, very, very much. But uh, he, he is very interesting because 
he represents actually the complexity of war and there is that there is no good or bad well there is a good and bad side but there is a mix in people so Andy here he used to be a gang member in Sweden a pretty tough gang member in Sweden so he used to be in pretty tough situations there he was uh, arrested he, he spent some time in jail in, uh, in Sweden and uh, the Swedish government uh, released him but uh, it offered him a certain amount of money per month uh, I'm not sure if it was un until the rest of his life or, or for some years uh, in the future like a pension if he leaves Sweden and doesn't come back they'll pay him as long as he's not in Sweden and he said well when I saw that the war is happening I couldn't let the Russians you know kill innocent people yeah I've killed people in Sweden but they were gang members you know they weren't good people and I'm protecting good people because and he actually is a, he's a cool guy but every time we, we were speaking there or on the phone he was very drunk and he was actually in one of the Nazi uh, regiments and that's why he left he was sending me photos uh, which I cannot show because I promised him not to of murdered Russians tortured killed mutilated because from from the group that he was in he said I cannot stand some 19 year old Nazi guy shouting how he's there uh, early in the morning so again uh, I'm not going to mention the specifics of the Russian propaganda right now because I'm sure that we're all aware that the Russians uh, are not doing great things that's why my talk may might seem a bit unbalanced I have to admit but uh, it seems that in not only in Bulgaria but abroad people are not so much familiar with what is happening and a lot of Ukrainians actually are very worried that after the war ends if this criticism is not uh, being put into, in the media and into the spotlight uh, they said uh, actually one of, of, of the women there who works for the government I'm not going to mention her name she told me we're worried that we're going to have a second Putin if Zelensky doesn't go uh, so there is obviously big issues and this is one of the specifics in Ukraine that we have to we have to know so this is Zoya she is 66 years old uh, I met her just hours after a Russian rocket hit uh, a, a factory like 20 meters away from her home that's her own building uh, in Kiev uh, so one of the specific another uh, thing that uh, specific in Ukraine is that Zoe is actually Russian she was born in Russia raised in Russia and she was so so confused of what is happening why it happened and so on so she was ethnically Russian she was against the war she was supporting Ukrainians but at the same time she also didn't want her country to fight she said let's you know it is better to give away our territories for this terror to stop but right now in Russia in Ukraine this is a very unpopular opinion and even outside of Ukraine and we cannot judge people uh, there are a lot of mixed opinions in Ukraine there are people uh, most of the people who I actually spoke to in Ukraine uh, they were speaking Russian by the way that's another part of the Putin's propaganda is that they banned Russian in, in Ukraine which is totally not true everybody was speaking Russian even between themselves uh, there are a lot of people there we cannot judge Ukrainians want this, Ukrainians want that, but the media somehow shapes our opinion, you, you are aware of this, shapes our opinion in a way that we should support one decision. This is the best decision, this is the best side, Ukraine cannot uh, make any war so on. But this type of thinking led to the American wars after the Second World War, this type of thinking led to the Wodomor uh, in Ukraine uh, committed by the Soviet Union to the countless wars and casualties. Um, concentration camps, gulags and so on if a country or a person start thinking that I am what, ineffable, is that the word that I'm thinking? Um, that they cannot make mistakes that at some point turns them into monsters and we have seen this a lot that's why um, what I tried to do while I was in Ukraine I was trying to represent the real picture and the criticism and what was happening there um, May we have please the next slide? Yeah, we'll speak faster. Okay, specifics of Ukraine, so uh, of Iran. Uh, this is uh, a mural of uh, Kasim Surlimani, uh, the revolutionary guard general and commander who was killed by American missile during the Donald Trump 
presidency uh, near the Baghdad airport. Uh, a very big figure now, almost you know, martyred. Not almost. He was martyred actually by the Islamic regime. What is interesting in Iran is that while in Ukraine you know who is your friend, who is your enemy. Your enemy is the Russian with the gun and the missile, and everybody in Ukraine was willing to help you. Uh, and that's very nice for, for a journalist. Everybody was very welcoming. You know that you can trust people there. In Iran, it wasn't like that because the regime is incredibly hostile towards foreign journalists, towards its own population. And I went there undercover. Uh, and knowing fully well that if they catch me, they'll probably send me to jail because at that point, the Iranian government actually uses a lot of foreigners for uh, exchange, um, for bargaining chips, sorry. Uh, to exchange them for money, for uh, lifting a small sanction or something like that. Uh, and some conflict zones uh, where you don't have the protection of one of the two sides, uh, the Ukrainians or somebody else, it is very dangerous to go there just like that uh, without any connection or something like this. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? So the thing is that the, I went in Iran uh, in October last year. That was my third visit to the country so far. Uh, and while in Ukraine you can take photos of everything, and people are very happy for you to take photos of them, in Iran that's not so much the case. Uh, yes, there was this cool gentleman in Com that, and many others actually, mostly guys naturally, uh, because the country has very restrictive policies against women, but in most places uh, in Iran, especially in the big cities, um, Esfahan, Tehran, uh, Shiraz, and so on, uh, in the centers, this, this especially in Stajirish Square, which is in the northern part of the capital, a very uh, rich uh, place, uh, most women walk just like this, this beautiful lady that saw me taking a photo of her 50 meters, no, not 50 meters away, but you know, uh, from a big distance with this big of a camera. And she was very suspicious and not only. The problem there is that people are very suspicious that you're not part of the government. Uh, so, and in Iran, as I said, you, you don't know who to trust. Or in other places like Afghanistan or the African uh, authoritarian regimes, you don't know who is your friend and who is not your friend. And the other thing is that these people don't know if you're their friend or not. Uh, and I was taking photos of a lot of women without hijabs. It's full of them in, in Tehran, especially. Uh, but they were very worried that I'm uh, uh, that I'm working for the government. Then I said, I'm not working for the government. I am uh, a foreigner. They say, okay, but how do you know that you were not hired again by our government? Uh, and in a minute, you will, you will find out uh, why. Uh, so, yes, you shouldn't talk to guys with these rings if you are against the government, especially. Uh, you can pretty much talk to these ladies for whatever you want against the government, they'll support you. But then again, you have to establish trust because everything can get you into jail there. Uh, you can say, um, uh, Mark Bar Dictator, which is down with the dictator, uh, or death to the dictator actually, and that will get you straight to jail if the police sees you. Uh, and these people don't know who to trust, and you should should be very, very um, careful with, with whom you're talking. If, if we may have the next question, of a slide, please. Uh, and one of the reasons is because uh, in Iran and most of these authoritarian countries, it is full of secret police. And you can see these two guys are member, yeah, uh, member of the Basiji, which is the paramilitary wing of the Revolutionary Guard. It's a militia there. So uh, what happened is that uh, uh, in Tehran, and not only in, in uh, Isfahan, Kashan, Qom, Yazd, all those places, is full of these people. How do you recognize them? So, uh, the, the locals actually told me. So, uh, in most of Asia, as you know, uh, these little um, bikes, uh, motorbikes are pretty, pretty um, widespread. Uh, and what they do is that they put this face mask on the registration plate. And 100%, the, the person who has this mask on his registration plate is part of the Basiji or some other governmental structure. And these people, they were scouring the streets, they were uh, going everywhere, looking for four, five, six 
people at one place, for, for small groups, mostly young people, your age, younger, a bit older, and they were knowing that something, a trouble was brewing. And when those people see you, they go and they arrest you or they report you to the police or do something like that. Uh, almost always there were two, they, they were in pairs, they had these small uh, backpacks, usually with a gun, with handcuffs, or with a baton to beat you up. And what we did here, actually, uh, the guy in the taxi, so I was with an Iranian friend of mine, and we were in the taxi, and we just told him, drive around Tehran for two hours. Uh, so I wasn't speaking. Uh, I was with more beard, with a hat, with sunglasses. I kind of looked, you know, I, Iranian. There are a lot of uh, white-skinned Iranians. Uh, my friend was, was not one of them, so and he was speaking. He just told him, drive around for two hours. And uh, this guy was actually thinking that we were part of the government, that we were the position, because I was with this big camera taking photos of people um, during traffic, especially women on the street, these guys, and that, that woman over there uh, with her hair uh, showing off under the, the, the scarf and the helmet. So the guy in the car was scared of us, and he didn't even want us to pay him for the, tra for the trip, but we did because we are the good guys, so we want to believe. Uh, so in every country from these conflict zones, there are certain aspects that you should be aware of. In Ukraine, you won't see that. Uh, but in Iran, yes. In Afghanistan, yes. Uh, if uh, we may have the, the next slide. So yeah, so these are some of the specifics. Of course, I can go, I can cover all of them. But uh, I hope that this will you know, make you think and be aware of what you should expect in s such type of countries and, and uh, places. Uh, this guy here, uh, he was guarding a uh, junkyard, actually, uh, full of destroyed Russian tanks and other um, armored vehicles. And he actually got into trouble because of, of uh, our group, uh, because one of the guys wanted to take a photo with a Kalashnikov. Uh, and if you have ever been in the army, maybe the two gentlemen over there, you know that you don't give your weapon to anybody no matter what. But this guy, pretty young, and that's why he was guarding a junkyard, he, he took his, actually, that was a good thing, he took his ammunition uh, out and he gave the weapon to one of my uh, colleagues and snapped several photos of him. And when his um, commanding officer saw this from across the junkyard, he was like this, and, and he came shouting in Russian, what are you doing, you know, stop, and uh, you, know, you know, we went away. But, so, lying as a journalist. In journalism, of course, truth is the best thing in the world, that's why we do, do it. Um, well, truth doesn't exist, objective truth doesn't exist, to be honest. Um, but this is a, 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 a conversation for another time. Uh, but lying as a journalist, especially in conflict zones, is the main thing that we do and that we should do if we want to do our job well. So, we lie to protect our sources, as in the case with people in Iran, when I meet with them, if I snap their photos, say their real names and addresses, the police will come and they will have a lot of trouble. So, especially in these places, you can, in, after that in your articles, you change their names, you don't publish their faces, uh, if those are people that you've spoken to, if it's some people on the street, that's, that's well, you can, we can argue here, but it is more acceptable. Uh, even what I do sometimes is I, I mix, mix some of the stories. So one person tells me something, and another person tells me another thing, and then I combine them into one paragraph saying that this one person said that. And again, this is only for places that are very, very, very strict. In Ukraine, they wouldn't care, but in Iran or China or some of these places, they'll go crazy about these things, especially uh, that you, in Iran, for example, they track your phones. Uh, you cannot operate without their SIM card, which is issued by the government. If you're a foreigner, you have to give the passport and the address of a, a local person. So again, it is, it is very controlled area. So we like to protect our sources. Then we like to protect ourselves. I'll give you um, other examples, uh, specific ones in a minute. But in this place, especially in Iran, I like, I'm a, a journalist, I just said I'm a stupid Russian tourist. I'll tell you in a minute why. Uh, we like to get more information. We always lie with good 
uh, intentions and uh, we never lie for any other reason. So uh, we'll go to the next slide. So as I told you at the beginning, uh, I met this lovely lady, which is the current, at that time she was very new on, on the position. Uh, that's the American ambassador to Ukraine. So uh, at that time, and I believe still, all foreign uh, press cards, uh, accreditations uh, are issued by the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense and you get uh, this press card by the army. But all of them go through the American embassy, actually. And the American embassy can say, we're not giving you this card, sorry. Uh, so uh, we uh, met her, so we, we were a group of two, uh, three journalists uh, and Ukrainian fixers. Uh, and by chance, we met her uh, in Irpin. And uh, just several days ago, uh, her um, head of the press office declined our accreditations and we were not actually allowed to go around Ukraine doing journalism business without these cards, but we lied. Uh, and when we met her, our um, fixer, one of our fixers there, he knows her press uh, officer and everything and he said, oh no, that's, that's the end of my career. But still, we, we convinced him to meet her. So we went there, uh, and uh, I said that I'm from Macedonia. Uh, the journalist from Georgia said he's from Armenia, and so on. Her, the head of the American press office knew right away who we are, actually, because he, has, he had seen our photos and everything. And he asked me, do you know this person? Uh, and I said, who is that? He said, well, that's the American ambassador in Macedonia. I was like, wow, really? He was like, do you know? Just several days ago, I declined the press accreditations of journalists from Bulgaria, Georgia, uh, well, uh, um, Mon Montenegro, and Montenegro. And here you are, one person from Macedonia, one from Armenia, and one from Serbia. Isn't that, uh, you know, a bit suspicious? And you're like, no, not at all. But, so he played along in this case. He knew, but he still let us speak to the ambassador. But in many of these cases, uh, you lie about who you are or what are you doing there uh, to get some information. That's especially from the officials. I mean, you don't lie to normal people you know, who you are. That's not very ethical. But uh, usually, politicians and, and officials are not very willing to give you information. And one of the most regular lies that I use, not only um, in conflict zones, but in Bulgaria, uh, is I say something as a fact. Uh, or that someone else has told me, or I make them agree with the claim that I make, or when they are denying it, to, to confirm it actually. So I say, hey, is it uh, so it's true that you're sending, let's say, uh, rockets to Poland, let's say, and she says, who said that? And I say, well, your colleague in some other place. <coughs> and she will say, no, no, we're not doing this. We're sending them to someone else. So uh, these are not uh, very good examples right now, but you have to, um, think of a way to twist the hands of the politicians and the officials because their job is to not give you information actually. So that's one of the cases when it is, in my opinion, permissible to, to lie. Um, may I have the next slide? So, um, another case uh, uh, when it's permissible to, that's a, that's, that's a, a photo of me during the uh, Russian artillery strike in the Zaporizhia uh, region. Uh, where we went uh, at that time. Uh, I have the other. Oh, no, that's. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, well, you can lie about this. And uh, here, so as I told you, we didn't have accreditations actually from the army. Uh, so we forged them. So we, we, we made some fake ones on, on Word. We took the application that we actually sent to the uh, embassy and the ministry uh, and uh, the regular soldiers do not know what an accreditation is what's the difference between an accreditation and uh, 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 um, application so we just forged this uh, and we were showing them to the checkpoints that we actually are accredited to go there to the front line and the soldiers were just like okay are you sure you want to go there you probably there is a chance you get killed or something we're like yeah 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 and we went there. So very often uh, you have to lie about what you're allowed to do or you have permission to do. Um, I, I believe Al Pacino uh, once said that it is better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. 
I know this is not a very good modus operandi for a, a person to have in their life, but in such situations, it is, it is in my opinion, it is um, okay if it's for the, for the greater good. And if you're actually willing to do something good with, with that thing. Uh, and in Bulgaria as well, if, if you go to some ministry and you're not allowed to be on that floor, I, I've entered many municipalities saying that, hey, yeah, I'm allowed, I have to meet this guy. Uh, and then I go and actually meet this guy who I wasn't allowed to. And then we have a talk and it's uh, great material. So you have to push your boundaries. You don't have to play it nice uh, in these situations, not always. And you may have the next slide, please. Okay, so lying in Iran. So uh, this is uh, Nadir, that's not his real name. Uh, I met him, that's a, a real fact, I met him at the Isfahan train station. Uh, his shirt leads. Uh, reads, uh, no other hero is like Ali, that's uh, Imam Ali, uh, and no sword is like Zulfikar, that's one of his famous swords. Uh, so, as I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, one of the lies you're, it's okay to say uh, after that is uh, saying, you know, changing his name or changing where you met this person, uh, not changing what he said, of course, we're not distorting the facts, but in, in Ukraine I haven't changed a single name or face of, of anybody that I've met there because there was no danger uh, to these people. Uh, and one of the lies that I was saying in, uh, in uh, Iran is right at the airport when I met some people, they actually gave me this advice, local Iranians and also my friends and colleagues, pretend that you're a stupid Russian. It won't be hard for you. I said thank you. Uh, why? Because Russia is an allied country to uh, Iran. And the Iranian authorities will not be willing to make troubles, uh, to create troubles for uh, ci citizens of an allied country of theirs. So the other option was to pretend that I'm Pakistani, but I don't look Pakistani. So Russian was great. Uh, and they said, pretend that you're stupid. Pretend that you you don't know what you're doing. You know, if you go to a protest, you know, just wander around, do something. Uh, if they catch you, just just start speaking in, in Russian or Bulgarian, they wouldn't know the difference, something like that. And be uh, played as stupid as possible, uh, so that they'll really believe that you you're, have nothing to do with journalism or anything bad, bad intentions against the government. Um, that doesn't work every time, obviously. Uh, and another thing is that when you go to such areas, especially China, by the way, but not only Israel and so on. They check your phones, they check your laptops, or they may do it. Uh, what I do is that I, first of all, I have, of course, a, a folder with a password on it, and everything on my phone is in Cyrillic. Uh, so when they open the phone, they wouldn't know where to press. Of course, if they, if they take the phone or the laptop to their agency or something, they will break it. That's, that's not a, an issue, but if a regular police or an officer in the police uh, station decides to check what you're doing, they'll just, you know, they wouldn't have time for you, you know. They'll see, okay, that's, that's in some other language. So maybe it's uh, in Arabic, maybe it's in uh, Cyrillic, maybe it's in any other kind of language that they cannot read in the country where you're going. Uh, and if we may have the next slide, please. Okay, so these are the, the sieges, uh, the militia uh, on uh, Azadi uh, Square. Um, not square um, uh, boulevard, which actually leads to Azadi Square in Tehran. Azadi means freedom uh, in Farsi. You can see actually school girls walking without hijabs in the perfect city center of Tehran uh, next to the militia. From time to time, actually, the militia was opening fire with rubber bullets uh, on, uh, against on them and on us. That was another question. This photo, uh, I told you that I went there with a big camera. And we did speak cameras pretending to be a stupid tourist, taking photos of everything that I see, even the police, from afar. But here, in this case, I wasn't with a big camera, so I was with my phone, uh, just checking like, like this, and taking photos and videos of what is happening, sitting at the cafe, leaving my phone next to a vase or a plant pot or something like that and uh, looking somewhere else while the camera is taking photos and videos. Especially my phone, which is, sorry, over here, uh, has, uh, that's a, well, no, okay, we're not on TV, that's a Galaxy, uh, Samsung Galaxy Note, so it has this pencil, as you know, it's pretty useful because 
from a certain distance, you can snap photos and videos with it. So you can leave your phone here, you can go to the other end of the cafe and just snap some photos and videos. And if the police sees you, there were a couple of cases where the police got really suspicious or people in, in bookstores or cafes, people with rings actually, uh, you can always claim, oh, that's not my phone, you know. Uh, but it won't protect you 100%, but it is some way to, you know, have a, a bit of, you know, uh, protection. Uh, and uh, in some other case, uh, instead of um, a camera, you know, when you just observe, because obviously if you walk like this all the time, they will get suspicious. Uh, you just walk around uh, with ice cream, with tea, with some food. You really pretend that you're there just for the fun. Um, may we have the next uh, photo, please? Yes, slide. Yes, so we uh, don't have that much time left. So. Uh, this is um, another Menti um, link uh, number actually where you can leave your um, feedback for, for uh, the presentation. You can say it was boring, you can say it was nice, you can say everything you like, uh, or even again um, ask some questions on the previous thing. Uh, and for now, uh, may I have. So, last advice uh, never take yourself too seriously because there is no point in it. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Of course, we will be open for some questions. Um, I hope that I managed to cover enough interesting uh, stories and, and, and ideas from, about lying in journalism uh, and covering conflict zones. Uh, I know that there is much more to be said, but um, I hope that still you found it. See if someone actually asked the question. Um, Menti or not? No. No. Okay. Well, everything is clear. That's that's great. Um, you can go to the other one. I, I'll see the feedback. I can just ask you questions right now. Yeah, that's yeah, how it usually works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyone? So, uh, <laughs> the yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Just two questions. Why not just a lot of uh, just curious. Why, according to you, uh, the American embassy was not giving a press accreditation to Bulgarian journalists from Montenegro and other countries you mentioned? Uh, was there any reason for that? Yeah, yeah, they actually said it was not only for us. There were other journalists, so they, for, for a period of about two months, at that time, they were refusing accreditation to journalists because several journalists got killed near Kharkiv by Russian artillery strikes. And they were very afraid of the bad publicity that would cause. That was the reason that they gave to our Ukrainians, fixers and stuff, and members of government and journalists unions and so on, that we contacted. But that was the main reason. After that, after I left Ukraine, I got my accreditation. And it is without a deadline, so I can't, uh, it, it doesn't have an inspiration that I can go there right now legally. So I will ask you not to inform the American Embassy <laughs> what I do with with uh, and the second question. Uh, just curious about what according to you what's your best story in uh, Ukraine or, or in Iran? I mean, or the story you were the most proud of? I mean, in one of your articles. Uh, I mean, you wrote some articles, obviously. So maybe there's one article you maybe uh, yeah. most proud of, or you know. Well, I, I, what I tend to do is I take a, a story and I just chop it in pieces. So that these articles are actually part of one story. But uh, what I'm proud of is the case with Iran. So everybody in, in, in most Western media and most people think that Iran is this horrible place where women get tortured, beaten, and so on. Uh, actually, and, you know, people are horrible. Actually, Iran is one of my favorite countries. Naturally, I wouldn't be doing a PhD about it. Uh, and I was very proud about actually showing the good things about Iran. 
actually Iran has, um, it sounds strange, but it has women's rights. It has this concept. It has a concept of, of protecting local ethnicities, ethnic minorities, even Jews, by the way. Um, it, it has influenced immensely European and, and world culture and history and politics and all those things. And I was very proud of showing this because nobody knows, for example, how many of you know the origin of the word paradise? Well, it's high, high in Arabic. I mean, yeah. No, but Persian could talk Persian. But Farsi. Farsi yes. way. So, yes. do you know the, the, the root? No, no, I just forgot that some of you uh, So, it, it comes from the word paradis, uh, which is a uh, world of garden. Yeah, yeah, world of garden. Uh, and actually, gardens, as the way we think of them nowadays, uh, came to be in Iran. They were they were created there, and that's why the Eden, you know, paradise, the the, the garden, uh, heavenly garden, comes from par from Iran, from Persia. The idea of it. Uh, actually, the, the tulip. Everybody knows that the tulip comes from the Netherlands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, the tulip come the tulip comes from Iran again, uh, and it is on their national flag. But few people know that. Uh, That's and why gardens are so important for uh, Muslim architecture, and you have all those a, a lot of. Uh, I mean, the gardens are with the centerpiece mm -hmm. in all those yeah. houses and palaces. Yes, and palaces. Yeah, and, and palaces. a lot of those things. And uh, few people know that Cyrus the Great, uh, here the Veliki in Bulgarian. Uh, actually, th that was their greatest uh, emperor, liberated the Jewish uh, nation from slavery in Babylon. Uh, and now everybody explains to us that the Persians have always hated Jews and so on. So it is very, you cannot explain all the nuances in, in one hour or two hours. Even I don't know, the, you know, I'm not an expert on anything. Um, but there are a lot of nuances, a lot of facts that people should know. That's what, that's from Iran, that's what I'm most proud of because I wanted to show people the other side of Iran, of the people, the protection of ethnic minorities. Even until this day, there is one place reserved in every Iranian parliament for a member of the Jewish minority. Two places for a member of the Armenian minority, and so on. Uh, it is very, very complicated. Uh, and Iran is not only bearded ayatollahs that kill women on the street. It's actually very, very different than this. And also, I want to show that there is another way than the European way. Then, of course, I'm, I'm not supporting the authoritarian regime in Iran, but another way of thinking, of, of culture, of food, of walking, of driving, of all of those things, because really our, our naturally, uh, our world and the way of thinking is very um, uh, Western sense centered. So it's a, um, Orient and Ascendent. Was, was the West in, in Latin, sorry, I forgot. Uh, and the thing is that very often what journalists from the West and politicians fail to, to relate is actually the, the, the way of thinking of these people, of their culture, why they're doing some things, and also the rules behind those things. Uh, that yes, women in Iran don't have the same rights as women in Bulgaria or in the West, but they have other rights, which we have lost. And, and the best course of action will be to, to take the best from both worlds, not just say everything there is bad. And from Ukraine, from Ukraine was, uh, uh, well, besides criticizing Zelensky, uh, was uh, actually showing how important Russian culture and language is there. Uh, because uh, even they say Russian is very important to us, but we have, have our own way. And again, I'm, I'm very fond of culture, as you may uh, see, uh, showing uh, how the Ukrainians hate Russia, but not the Russian culture. And that although that you know they, they are trying to go back to Ukrainian, Russian is still very important to them. And that they are, despite all the hardships, they're very self-critical, which is fantastic. But they're also furiously opposed to the Russian invasion, which is also fantastic. And I'm sure, and I hope that after the war ends, Ukraine will become one of the great European countries. It has the human potential, it has the natural resource potential, uh, 
uh, very, very tasty food. So, yeah. Why do you have to pretend and hide if you mostly wanted to show what is good about Iran? Uh, no, I, I didn't show what was mostly good. That was the, the one article I was most oh, proud okay, of. Okay. But after the, I was hiding from the police who were shooting at us with rubber bullets, um, taking photos of government of buildings, of police, of, of reporting on um, jailings and executions and stuff. And of course, when I want to speak with people who know what's happening, uh, in those countries that's academics, journalists, and other type of, let's say, intellectuals. Um, and those people are usually watched. Uh, because if you go to university to speak to an intellectual, for sure someone will notice and probably this person will have an issue about. So you have to hide, you have to meet in cafes or some faraway places, you have to be careful who tracks your phone because as I said you have to have their SIM card which is entirely controlled by the government. So what well, can you use you have your PhD on the on Iran Balkan relations? I mean to be to uh, pass the student is the best cover, right? For anybody. Yeah, yeah, I, I can also use this and by the way um, as I said you have to clear your phone from all those information. I left all my press cards in Bulgaria. But uh, Yes, but especially in Iran and such type of auto authoritarian regimes, they again um, jail students, uh, especially PhDs uh, and researchers yeah, so for bargaining chips. You, you, yeah, as, no, okay. yeah, you know that. So again, this is even more dangerous saying, yeah, yeah you know, stupid yeah. student. So you just say I'm Russian. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even if you're not Russian, you speak like Russian and you drink. I'm not drinking in Iran, by the way. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. I have a question from the stream. So how do you maintain objectivity in a war zone akin to Ukraine, where the horrific visuals of war may leave you prejudiced against one actor? I am prejudiced against one actor. I mean, I fully support Ukraine, as I said. And I'm against the Russian invasion. I don't believe that there is a journalist who is objective, in, like a robot, uh, saying, this fact and this fact, that's it. I don't care. Um, yeah, but you still look at both sides. You're relatively yeah. neutral as, as possible yeah. as you can be. Well, that's, that's how you do it. You answer the question. You look at both sides. And when you see something bad in each of these sides, you don't keep your mouth shut. You, you publish it. But you don't publish it. I very much hate when journalists or <coughs> people just put something bad and say, that's it. You have to give the reason for it. You have to search for the root, for the cause. Uh, other than that, we're nothing but the Facebook or Twitter commentator who says, who is criticizing everything for everything. You know, so yeah, you you definitely see what bad things the Russians are doing, but when someone tells you, hey, yeah, yeah, they did that, but we should be aware of Zelensky and the Nazis or, or for smuggling and corruption and oligarchs, you don't say, oh, shut up, that, that's not important. But you do publish it, and obviously one of the biased things is what things uh, journalists choose to focus on. Because a lot of the things that I'm saying as criticism against uh, the Ukrainian government, the Russian propaganda is saying. But the difference is that the Russian propaganda is saying only this and, you know, multiply and it is not um, criticizing itself. Once you start criticizing everything else but yourself, this is propaganda. We have it in America, we have it in Bulgaria, we have it everywhere, but the degrees do um, depend. Uh, any more questions? Yes, uh, what is your name? Drugo. Huh? Drugo. Drugo? Yeah. Okay. So in one of the photos from Iran, you saw, we saw like uh, the bikers were hiding yeah. their name plates. Uh, who were those people? Were they hired by the government? Yes. And why would they need to hide their vehicles? Well, because a lot of those people, so they are uh, hired as mercenaries for the government. So they don't have a permanent position in the government. They're just hired to beat up people or to spy on people. And a lot of them actually go around with their personal bikes. And to protect themselves from uh, retribution from their name, because a huge percentage of the population is actually against the government. And a lot of them are 
not non believers actually. This is another topic about Iran that simply they actually don't believe most of them uh, in Islam or anything. Uh, so they are hiding for their own protection. Because there were cases of besieges, so the, the militia for the Islamic Guard, uh, some of these people were part of the besiege, are besiege, some of these people are just some hired militia, some of them are civil policemen, it is mixed. Uh, but most of them are with their own bikes and um, they will just track them and probably kill them or uh, harass them when they can. So it's, it's very, uh, you know, in 10 o'clock, either 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the evening, I, you know, I forgot, sorry, um, everybody in Tehran, and not only Tehran, were opening their windows and shouting at the same time, Mark, Bar, Dictator, what I said. That was a chant of the protest, death to the dictator. Uh, not everybody, but a lot of people. You can hear it in the neighborhoods. You can see graffiti, death to the besiege, death to the dictator, death to Islam. So a lot of people were actually against the militia and the government. So it can be dangerous for you, even if you're government. That's why I said, everybody in, in, in authoritarian regimes, the worst thing is that you don't know who to trust. You don't know who's who, who is listening to you, the big brother, who is paid, who is brainwashed from all the sides. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm a little confused about, so you had the picture of the girls without the hijabs. I'm confused, is, I thought it was a law that they had to wear them. Yeah, it is a law. But the thing is that nobody applies it because if you have to apply the law, you have to sanction or jail one-fifth of Tehran, which is Tehran is around 10 million people. Uh, the thing is that, so, most of the high-end uh, generals, politicians, so on in Iran are very corrupt and very rich. Uh, Iran is very westernized. You can find anything there, Rolex, Lego, Kinder Surprise, anything. It, it, it is just more expensive than their stuff. So their families actually dress in Western clothes, drive Western cars, their sons, it is the same as in Russia, the same as in any other, or in Bulgaria even, you know, we have politicians who are, you know, criticizing the West in Europe, but their kids are in London, in New York, and so on. Um, their kids just say, screw it, you know, I like wearing fancy clothes, I like uh, listening to Western music, and so on. So if they do it, they have to sanction or jail their own children or themselves. Uh, and so many women on the street, so they all have the hijab, the scarf, but they wear it around their necks or they just put it like that. So I'm not saying everybody, but in Tehran especially, I would say one third of the women uh, don't wear it at all. One third wears it, you know, just like a fashion or something, and one third does wear it. Outside of Tehran, it's very different. If you go to a small village, it's different. If you go to Qom, the Islamic uh, heart of Iran, where the, all the ayatollahs and mullahs are, yes, of course, women wear it. Uh, but in most places, they won't make a trouble. Even if they see a police, they will sometimes put, but especially in the northern part of Tehran, which is extremely rich and lavish, no, because the other thing is that the police don't know whose daughter or son they're going to stop. Um, it, is, it is kind of the same as in Bulgaria, you know, when the police stop some stupid guy with a fast car and he says, oh, I'm the son of this politician, you get fucked if, sorry for that word, if you, you know, make me pay a fine, you know, the police now doesn't know who to, who to stop. It's the same in Iran, they don't know who this rich girl is and or if they have trouble. So, and that's the thing, our media doesn't represent in the correct way what's happening in Iran and why it is happening. It has nothing to do with Islam, nothing. Their ruler, their politicians and generals, and even ayatollahs are not believers, a lot of them. I've met it with a lot of ayatollahs, of mullahs, religious figures that said, we are against you know, women wear the hijab. Yes, we want them to, but we are against forcing. Uh, so it is very mixed, and especially in Iran, it's very, it's not reported in a correct way, because there is this, this bias in Western media against the Muslim world, and especially in Iran, 
that everything is about Islam. Actually, almost nothing is about Islam in these places. Because you can ask me, are you a Christian? I can say yes. But we, we say in Bulgaria, Christian from Christmas to Christmas. Uh, the Muslims say from Bayram to Bayram. Um, because they, they say I'm Christian, but they don't fast, they drink alcohol, they, they have sexual relations before marriage, and that's, that's fine. But again, it depends on, on, the, on the economic situation in, from country to country. I mean, in Tunisia, where I used to live and work, uh, it is much very different than Iran. But Iran is much bigger and richer. It is richer than Bulgaria in many regards. So yeah, it, it really depends economically also. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question on uh, Ukraine. Uh, it is, I mean, I believe most of us will agree on the corruption and Nazis part uh, from different degrees. And how to communicate this in a debate and not be perceived as a, a Russian supporter? Because it is there, it is flat, and people don't agree on it, even though it is true. Can I add something to this question, please? Because it is kind of true. Amnesty International put out a report saying exactly what you were saying. And it is a legitimate report from people whose job is to do that. They do that in every com conflict area. They go to The Hague and they actually go there to get bad people to prison, like dictators, people who are accused of war crimes, crimes against humanity. The second they put out that report, the entire world jumped on them to the point where they had to apologize for it. How do you fight that? Well, well, uh, Imam Ali said, uh, they said that he said it, but I'm not sure he did. Uh, he said, let's, let's say, uh, saying the truth left me with no friends. Uh, that's it. You, you have to say, you have to bear the consequence. There is no way of saying it in a way that everybody will accept. Uh, just like with the awards that we give Golden Shishi, we are at war with every media basically in Bulgaria. But you have to say, you have to say that uh, the Barack Obama should be in jail, not receiving Nobel uh, Prize for uh, peace. Uh, but you know, you have to say what you believe is true. And my way of thinking what is good, what is true, what should be pursued, pursued is what is the best and what makes actually the world better and the situation better in the end. Uh, and if you protect criminals, that's not making the world a better place. So, I mean, big trouble, yes, I got blamed that I'm a pro-Russian spy or whatever. I'm not a journalist, I'm, you know, imagining things, but the, the sad truth is, and this has been proven by uh, scientists in research and so on, that people uh, do not believe and are not um, convinced by facts. They are convinced by their emotions. And even more so, they are convinced if we take um, non-verbal communication in a debate or in uh, some public uh, event, People actually, the, the opinion of people who won the debate, around, I would lie to you about the percentage now, but it was something like 50 to 60 percent comes from your non-verbal communication. How do you stand, how do you speak, how do you present yourself. So if a guy sitting next to me says all the correct things, all the true things, but his verbal communicate, non-verbal communication is not very good, or he is not pleasing to the people looking at him. If I, well, I'm not the, the most handsome guy, but if let's pretend that I am, like I'm Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. So if I'm Dwayne Johnson and I say the biggest lies in the world, or Ryan Gosling, okay. Um, but if I'm perceived well by, by these people, they'll say that I won the debate. Uh, there is no way around. People will hate you because uh, even you know, if you are in a Bulgarian political party and you s criticize your own party for something, you will get ostracized. 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 ostracized, yeah. Uh, but I believe that journalists and people in general should be able to, to say what is right and what is wrong. I don't believe in left or right. Huh? Yeah, I, no, 
Яблоко Божанко is actually pretty smart folks. He should not be trusted. He saw that 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 space drowning, so singing. So yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, you should always say what you think is true and it's best. So yeah. Uh, any more questions or uh, you're fed up? Well, uh, if you don't have a questions, uh, I think that will be it. And uh, we have some uh, uh, advice for you guys. Yeah, uh, and uh, you can approach everybody here. You can uh, talk with each other. That would be great. And thank you for uh, coming and spending some time. Thank you. Thank you. You can add me on Facebook, Kalyan Institute, or uh, you can take it from uh, my friend over here. Uh, if you like or have more questions, or